Welcome to 784, the podcast that helps you leave a godly legacy for future generations by showing you incredible things God has done in the lives of men and women around the world. If he can do those things in these people's lives, imagine what he can do in yours. I'm Bob. And I'm Matt. So today, Bob, we're going to talk about how to be a godly leader. Yep. Since it became pretty obvious in our last episode that serving is maybe the most important trait of a great leader since Jesus himself served all the way to dying for our sins, we thought it might be a good idea to look into some other traits of what makes a great leader. Because face it, like it or not, we're all leaders in something. Whether it's leading your family, being in charge of a project at work, anything we are responsible for in this world We are now in the role of leadership. So when we lead, how do we lead well? Because when we don't lead well, we can kind of ruin everything (laughs) around us. In fact, it's the only time Jesus and Spider-Man come together and agree, Bob. What? Jesus said in Luke 12, and Uncle Ben, right before he dies, (laughs) says to Spidey, with great power, comes great responsibility. That's that's biblical, huh? And then in, in Luke, whoever is given much, much will be demanded. Ah, the apostle Peter Parker. <laughs> and so when we find ourselves in that position as leaders, we have the responsibility to lead well. Or God might take it away real quick. I know for years, I was actually very scared to have a leadership role because of something I read that happened to Moses. Do you remember, Bob, how he lost the chance to lead the Israelites to the promised land? Sure. That dude was put in charge of the Israelites. He was the man who walked and talked with God. You you couldn't, right, Bob, get much closer than Moses got with God. Exactly. And one day God tells him to speak to a rock to make water come out that they needed. Right. Instead, he hits the rock. (laughs) With his staff. That's it. That's, that's the only thing he did different than what God said. And for that small misuse of the power that God gave him in leadership, he was banned from the promised land that he had spent 40 years leading them to. Well, it's a little bit more than that, but yeah. Well, okay. I, right. But I, I read that. Yeah. I read that, I think, in high school. And I was like, no thanks to leadership. I, I really said that to myself. I said, one screw up and I'm toast. I thought, I'll just lay low and then God won't smite me. S- smote me? Do you get, do you get smited or, or smote? Bob? <laughs> Smitten? I think God would smite you. He's probably thinking of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that fear, it held me back. And it kept me for many years from doing all that, that I think God had planned for me at that time. And it lasted for a while until I understood that, first of all, like it or not, we're all leaders in something in life. And two... Fear of being a bad leader should never keep me from being who God called me to be, who loves me and wants the best for me, who gave you certain talents and responsibility to use them to help people. But the fact remains, we've seen plenty of leaders screw up, whether it's in government or bosses. So how can you, when you find yourself leading, how can you be a good godly leader in your life? What are the ingredients for that? And so today... We'll hear from three people who found three qualities that will help make you, me, Bob, all of us better leaders when God gives us that chance to lead. Over the years, I, I've reported to some, some great leaders, yeah. some good leaders, mm-hmm. and some who, how should I say? Uh, how do you say? Taught me a lot about how not to lead. <laughs> One of the great leaders was Bill Bright, the founder and for... 50 years, president of Campus Crusade for Christ, or crew in the U.S. Now, Bill wasn't perfect. He didn't always make perfect decisions. But you always knew his heart was in the right place. Our first guest, John Nyquist, has a great story about what he learned about leadership from Bill Bright. Bill was a humble man. And I have come to learn With people who are celebrities, let's say, Christian and non, people who are leaders, people who are uh, presidents and CEOs and athletes, entertainers and stuff, very few in the spotlight can handle it. 
it goes to their head, and they do things and say things as if they were bulletproof. And I know that Bill never thought that he was close to being sinless. And I heard him speak on a regular basis about uh, ways in which God has helped him and encouraged him and strengthened him to remain pure. And as I recall, we had district directors meetings and we were discussing many things, but there were a couple areas where Bill and I disagreed. And I learned that Bill could dig in on a position. And by the end of the day, we're aware of the fact that when Bill said this is going to take place, maybe it wasn't very good policy to try and oppose him, but I did in as gentle a way as I could. But nevertheless, we remain apart on this particular quest. And that night I was staying in our motel and about one o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on the door and I opened it carefully and I opened it to find Bill Bright in his pajamas and a robe and slippers out in the hallway and asked if he could come in. Yeah, I guess, Bill, you can come in. And so he sat on the bed and Bill said, I have come to apologize. He said, I did not treat you very well like a brother in Christ. And he said, would you forgive me? And uh, it was a very tender moment. And we prayed together and uh, there was weeping in our room. And this was a very, very teachable moment for me about a leader who was willing to come and to uh, confess. I'd learned a lot from Bill over the years, but this one sticks in my mind as being something that helped me learn how to be transparent, how to, to humble myself in situations where I might otherwise maybe have swept it under the rug. And I learned that through that, uh, I could trust Bill. May not always be right, but I'll follow him. I'll follow him. He may not always be right, but I'll follow him. It's amazing how humility builds trust. Right, and if trust is key to people being led, then the key ingredient to building that trust is, I think, consistent humility. Admitting we aren't perfect. We all make mistakes. And that God, God is the one who's really in charge, not us. Yeah. How many leaders have we seen in history play the strong man, act like they can do no wrong, basically are above us, a God? Yep. What always happens to them in the end? What does history always say? At some point, they're revealed to, in fact, be humans. Oh, yeah. And not indestructible terminators. And they lose the faith of everyone who followed them. Instead, what if, when we lead, we kind of admit that we want to do what's best, but we're not perfect, but that we serve a God who is perfect and let him guide us as leaders. And when we show humility, man, I think people we're leading will go to the trenches for that leader because you're showing that you care. So, Bob, you were mentioning Bill Bright before. I never got a chance to meet him, but you did. Do you have any stories of Bill and showing that he cared? Tons. One that happened to me was whenever I had to do a video shoot with him, we would would chit-chat along the way. But this one day, his assistant came in and said, hey, Dr. Bright is in the middle of these meetings down the hall with all of these major leaders, these Christian leaders from around the world, this group and that group and the what Im- have The you. important people. The important people. He says, and this is a critical meeting. He does not have a lot of time. So he needs to get in and get out as quickly as possible. And I'm like, no problem. We can do that. I finished setting up. Dr. Bright comes walking in. And as always, it, he started off with, my dear, dear Bob. <laughs> and I say, hey, Dr. Bright, how you doing? And he'd give me a bear hug and he'd say, Oh, my, my corpuscles are standing at attention, uh, singing the Hallelujah Chorus. Corpuscles, which was, huh? Yeah, that's, that was one of his, uh, like, every time. <laughs> and we prayed, and then after he prayed, he said, Bob, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, Dr. Bright. You know, we got to watch the, watch the clock here, you know. <laughs> and so we do the shoot. took maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then he asked me again, Bob, how are you doing? And, you know, he said, I'm fine, Dr. Bright. 
And he goes, no, Bob, how are you? And I I don't have the world's greatest poker face, I guess, but... Remind me to play poker with you. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. I, I said, well, my, my family back home are, have some struggles going on. So he told his his assistant is coming in and going, Dr. Bright, you got to meet with these men. And these are important. These are huge these are big, leaders. big, big, big guys. Yeah, it's uh, an important meeting. Important, important meeting. And he, Dr. Bright said, you tell those men to wait. Huh. And so he took me into the boardroom that was off from his office. And he asked me about what was going on. And then he prayed for me. And I was just so blown away by that because it's not like he was just holding back his lunch a few minutes. <laughs> When, you know, when you consider all that they were discussing, really, in the scope of things, who am I compared to what was going on? And yet Dr. Bright valued me enough to set all of that aside to pray for me. And I saw him do that several other times where if someone was hurting, he would stop his agenda to minister to them. Yeah, caring has to be a key ingredient. But One of the other important qualities we're going to learn from the next guest, Maggie Brill. Trying to lead in what was 20, 30 years ago, especially in our society, a male-dominated world. Yeah. And in our ministry at the time, too. It proved difficult for her, as I'm sure it did and still does for many women. But then she found what I'm calling our second ingredient to good godly leadership, which is this. God made both man and woman, and he made them in his likeness, meaning no matter how you feel about gender roles and all that, the character of God is both the qualities of men and of women. So we need both qualities to be a godly leader. So let's hear what Maggie says about that. I think I've realized in leading that men are very different than women. I read a book years ago that was called Play Like a Man, Win Like a Woman. It's by a secular author, and so you have to take that into account as you're reading it, but it was written by a vice president of CNN, a woman, who talked about how that men, when they relate, they are focused on something different, like they play basketball together or baseball. So they're focused on the game, not on the relationship. We as women play dolls, two dolls relating to each other. And so we tend to focus on the relationship. Men realize that they can push themselves, each other around under the basket. And that's okay, because as long as they're friends enough to play again the next time, it's all right. And so there have been times when I have needed to stand nose to nose with a man and let him know where the limits are in a respectful but understanding way that I've had several of the men come back to me and thank me. And so I had to learn to play a little bit more like a man, to push around a little bit. Not, again, in a disrespectful or harmful way, but to match how things were being said. It's okay to be passionate about something or to disagree. That doesn't mean that the relationship is going to be broken. Women, if you push us around, we're afraid that we're going to hurt the relationship. And so sometimes we'll hold back. And I started to realize that if God had placed me in a position, I needed to own it. I needed to realize, just like Esther was called into a court, it was as if I was called into a court of opportunity. And I needed to bring whatever it was that God was asking me to bring. I remember at one point in time I was asked to lead a task force of, at that point it was all men. I was the only woman that was in it. And there were, there were some people in that group that had very strong opinions. And they would really come at each other. And someone asked me, where did I learn my facilitation skills? And my comment was, if you've ever gone on vacation with four children in the back seat, you know how to facilitate (laughs) an agreement to be able to set direction and get people to align to it so that they know where that they're all going. So I realized that a lot of the skills that I had gained just as being a mother, 
I realized God had been preparing me for the whole time I was raising children. But I have to admit, I have bruised some guys. And I've had to go back and repair those relationships. There are times when I can go too far. But God has just taught me a lot of lessons in how to lead as a woman um, and that it's important for women to lead. That it's really as women come alongside and shoulder the responsibility with a man that we become partners in it. And our gifts and abilities have much more of a platform for God to be able to use them towards his kingdom. I love how Maggie basically realized quickly and adopts both qualities yeah. when she leads. That's where the, the great Tom Cruise line and Jerry Maguire, you complete me, oh, gee. takes on a whole new meaning in leadership. Joker says that too in The Dark Knight. Oh, I don't like that. It was much better when Tom Cruise said it very sweetly to his girl. To be a good godly leader, yes, you need to stand strong in your convictions. You need to turn vision into action. But if we don't balance that, as she said, with a strong, respectful relationship with those we lead, they won't follow. No matter how great the idea or the action point that we set, God is a God of action, conviction, strength, but he's also a God of love, of relationship, of kindness and compassion. So when we lead, we lead in all of God's image and character. Yeah, I started my career working in in TV news. I was a yeah. TV news cameraman. Or if it bleeds, it leads. So it will, exactly. A cut, it's a cutthroat. Oh, it, it, very cutthroat, right. very cutthroat. And one of the managers told me the company's philosophy was that the sign of a good leader was that their employees hated them hmm. because that meant the boss was making them work hard. That's, and that's kind of the opposite of what we were just saying. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> moronic. <laughs> And I can't imagine. And well, I know what it was like working under those conditions. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. We've heard from godly leaders how critical humility and relationships are in leading people. Our next guest, Jim Wonder, is a friend who has put those values to practice. And by the way, something we mentioned last week still applies here. The folks we feature in this episode all work for a Christian organization. But that doesn't mean the lessons they've learned can't be applied to the secular world. No. In fact, everywhere you go, you are an ambassador for Christ, whether you're an accountant, a bricklayer, a pastor, or an at-home mom or dad, especially at home where your spouse, your kids, roommate, or whoever needs to see Jesus living in you. That's the greatest witnessing tool you'll ever have. So here's Jim with some absolute gems he learned as a leader. For years, I thought, how do you know when to be a John the Baptist? How do you learn to say your success and your glory is in others being up front? I was part of the high school ministry. We were starting a new high school in Riverside, California. It was a wide open school. Uh, we could do anything we wanted there. Teachers knew me. Kids knew me, coaches knew me. Wow, it, 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 it was as good as it gets. It was just like everything we touched turned to gold. And then one day, the principal called me in and said, Jim, I've made the decision not to allow you on campus anymore. And I said, uh, Mr. Principal, uh, why? I just don't want you. I go, what have I done illegal? Nothing. In fact, you do everything legal. You are well within the boundaries of the law. And, and I said, so why am I not allowed on campus? He says, I'm the principal. It's my decision. You're gone. The only way you get back on campus is if you take me to court. I was like stunned. And I walked out and I stood outside the campus. And it was an open campus, but there were doors. And uh, they closed the doors. And there I stood outside. And I thought, how can I do this if I can't get on campus? I can't speak in classrooms. I can't help with school activities. I can't walk around and meet kids at lunch. All that stopped. And I realized at that point that everything I had done was what I affectionately have come to call the Jim Wonder Show. 
and everything that revolved around me, I can't do anymore. And one of the passages that he led me to was Philippians chapter 2. You have Jesus in heaven with God. From all eternity, glory, everything. And Jesus gave all of that up and came to earth to be a servant. A servant to the point of death. Uh, and God said, are you willing to be a servant, Jim? Are you willing to die to your glory? Are you willing to die to your name being known? Are you willing to die to all of the benefit that comes from being, you know, really good at something? I struggled with that, and eventually I said yes. And when I finally surrendered to that, that I needed to change the way that I thought about things, that I need to move from a me focus to a we focus. And rather than have the ministry revolve around me, how do I get it to revolve around them? And I moved it from I have to be at everything to both teachers and students were taking responsibility for the ministry at that school. And the good part of that story is we doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size. And I realized that their success is my success. As they excelled, I was part of their excelling. I never thought of the glory of this kind of opportunity to make others shine, to impart to them the things that we've learned. And it's, you learn it, it's just if Jesus had not left the throne and come and gave it all up, trained others, and then at the end said, I'm out of here. And he actually didn't say, and if he didn't say, and it's good that I'm out of here, how do we learn to say it's good that I'm out of here? It is the opportunity to train the next generation. I've done my job. I pointed them to Jesus. It is now in your hands. I ran track in high school, and I actually ran relays. And you can't win the race by holding on to the baton. You've got to pass it. If I hold the baton the whole time myself, I can't win. And so. Part of what I've learned in my journey in leadership was I learned some essential things as a youth and it was all about me. And that was okay. I learned a lot. I did a lot, accomplished a lot. But there was a point where it could only grow as big as me. It grew with a ceiling. And the only way to get through that ceiling is I could no longer be a just me. And I had to learn how do I multiply myself through people that I work with. And I have learned not only to be a we, so it's from me to we, and then it's about how I can give this to you so you can run with it. Their success is my success. As they excelled, I was part of their excelling. That's the crux of, of leadership. It's not about making yourself look good. It's about building up those around you so that they are successful. And then everyone is successful. Right. I, I spoke before that leadership has these ingredients. And the first ingredient I think we learned in the last episode, if you haven't heard it yet, go back and listen to that. It's to serve. What are we leading for if not to try to make someone or something better? Not us better. Or not give me power. But leaders serve the goal and the people that they are leading. And then we learn the other ingredients to godly leading. Through John, we learn the power of humility. Through Maggie, we learned not only the value of relationships, but also how men and women can relate to each other so that everyone is successful. And Jim talked about the benefits of building up your team and setting them loose to do what you've trained them to do. In God's economy, success comes when you humble yourself and build up others. Right. Bob, one way I like to look at leadership is kind of from the opposite perspective, as in, who do you want to follow? Do you want a leader who is humble, 
who puts God first and serves you and the goal above themselves, who has a good relationship with you and cares about you, someone who doesn't hold tight to power but releases it to you and passes on that responsibility to the next generation. I mean, if that's who you want leading you, then that's who you should want to be when you lead others. Literally, a good leader only exists if there are people who want to be led by them. Otherwise, you're just a dictator, a false god. And on the flip side, if you're like I was years ago, if you hide from leadership, try to bury what God gave you deep in the sand, God actually says what happens oh, in, yeah. in a parable of the talents. If you don't do anything with whatever responsibility he hands you, what little you have left will be taken from you. But to those who he gives much responsibility, if you use it, much more will be given. And he promises given to you in abundance. And when I did read that part, when I finally got to that part, I did change my tune. It makes a difference. On fearing leadership. So that ends our episode on how to be a good godly leader. Our hope is that whatever God has given you, you shepherd it well, and cooking with the leadership ingredients we gave you today, become a better leader wherever God puts you in life. What we hope with 78.4 is that it'll help you flourish in your relationship with Jesus and also flourish as a leader. We've got some really good articles in our show notes to help you become a better leader. And one thing I'm gonna include is a link to a powerful leadership tool called Leading with Questions by Bob Teedy. Bob's a leader I greatly love and respect. Please check these resources out. Also, please email us. We'd love to get to know you. And the audio you heard today comes from some of the more than 600 and counting videos on our website, legacy.crew.org. That's legacy.cru.org. We also have a YouTube channel, Crew Legacy, and a Facebook page. Please check it out. And if you like today's podcast, we ask that you please subscribe so you can get the next one and the next one. And after that comes the next one. Also, please rate us. It helps others hear about the podcast. 78.4 is a podcast of Legacy, a project of Crew. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. And while we're away, we want to encourage you, as always, to remember that whatever God did in the lives of the people you heard speak today, He can do in you. So until we're together again, go out there and continue the legacy. Legacy.